Gospel of Mark, to hear as Jesus goes from one place to another to another, again, healing and preaching and feeding. And so we have one of the feeding passages uh, this morning. And as I said, I'm, I'm kind of just working my way slowly through uh, Mark. This is not the way the New Covenant Lectionary usually does this. But I, as we're doing this together, I'm just amazed at how often Jesus is feeding um, so many people. Because, I, anyway, it's just, I'm enjoying this. Good old Mary. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying scripture. Um, so he has gone from one place to another. And in those days, when there was again a great crowd without anything to eat, Jesus said to his disciples, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days, three days that he's preaching and teaching, and they have nothing to eat, run out of food. If I send them uh, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples replied, how can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They had also a few little fish, and after some blessing of them, he ordered these two that they should be distributed. And they ate their fill, and they took up the broken pieces that was left over, and they had seven baskets full. And now there were about 4,000 people and he sent them away, and immediately they got into a boat with his disciples, and he went to the district of the Mathos. There ends the reading. May God add a blessing. And so this morning we have another feeding story, and as I thought about the story, I thought about my grandmother. My grandmother uh, was full-blooded Sicilian. She had, uh, well, the story goes, I'll tell you the whole story. My granddaddy had come over a couple of times. Uh, he was from Sicily. He was shepherding uh, by the time he was five years old. But as he grew to be about, I think about 14 or 15, probably younger than Ian, he had had enough of Sicily. Um, the, re the standard family response was he didn't like the mafia and he didn't like the Catholic Church and there was nothing left in Sicily, so he left. And he came to this country and he went back and forth a couple of times. And then finally he went back to find a wife. I think his third visit home, he went to find a wife at age 28. Uh, grandmother was, again, younger than Ian. She was 16 years old and uh, brought her back to this country. My grandmother was 4 foot 10. I am tall. <laughs> and this woman, the minute you walked near her, she embraced you. She didn't come to our house often, but one time she came and I was in middle school and she was hugging all of my friends. So I was like, because <laughs> she just didn't do that. But the thing about grandma, the biggest thing about grandma was the minute you got near her, she was feeding you. That was the way I think she spoke in love. And as I was reading this passage, I thought that's Jesus, this compassion, this love is poured out in food. And so you did not get far. She would bring you into the kitchen the minute you made it up those steps to their house. Kevin, I got a piece of pizza. You eat. It's not too bad. I don't make a but it's a pretty good, you know? You eat. She would grab it. You're so skinny. And I was like, grandmother, I am not skinny. <laughs> Come, you eat, you eat. And she would feed us from the minute that we got there until the minute that we left. And she would send more food home with us. And there was, there were stories about grandmother feeding people, always feeding people, simple food. I would ask my mother, you know, what did you eat? Because her father was, uh, granddaddy was a coal miner. And they were a coal miner in the middle of the depression uh, in the mountains of Virginia. <laughs> she said, bread and butter. Grandmother would get up and make bread and they'd have butter from the cow and they'd have bread and butter. But the stories were that no matter who came near, and there was a week or so that I sit with my grandmother um, in, the, uh, in the summer, and somebody came to deliver a package. UPS guy, hi. You come in, you eat, I got some skinny, you got some skinny. Some... The poor guy could not leave until he had eaten. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, just give it up. You're gonna have to eat before you leave this place. <laughs> 
But that love and that care and that abundance of, of course, we feed one another, of course, that lives in love. And I thought about this passage of just that love of Jesus being poured out, not only into what he speaks. And so this is the place to me where the, the who Jesus is, that connections are made, hopefully, is it's not just about preaching, as he did, uh, and teaching them, apparently for three days in this setting, but also saying, and now it's grown late, and everybody who brought food with them, it's running out. And so let's find something that we can share. Let's find something that we can pass to one another. And as I've said, I think these stories are also here for the early church, because the early church was getting worn out. They were tired. It was hard. It was hard in their environment to be Christian. It was hard not to get persecuted or to lose your job or be thrown out of your place of worship, which was the synagogue. And so the story is there to remind them that even as they offer the little bit that they had, seven loaves, it was sufficient for the day. How does that happen? I'm not sure. What is the message? I'm pretty clear. The message is the little bit that I have to offer is multiplied when I give it to God. That is, I praise God and live in God's way that I become strengthened to be God's person in the world because it's God's love that I am sharing. It's God's power that is going out there. It's God's peace that is continuing to be sent. My first Habitat for Humanity project, I was amazed at how many people came out simply to help this guy make his house bigger and more habitable for all of the kids that he had collected. <laughs> he had children, the woman that he married had children, they were taking in foster children, and so a uh, household from him and his son had grown to, I think there were like six or seven kids. And so the trailer that he lived in, he was expanding all of that. But people came willingly, happily, to hammer on a roof or, you know, shoot in some insulation or, heaven forbid, have to spackle sheetrock. Never want to spackle sheetrock again. <laughs> it's never smooth. But anyway, moving on. But that act of love, of giving a little bit that you have, that again, I think we pretty much by the end of it had a few hundred people who were coming in for a time, doing a job, and then going off to do their other life. But they were willing to share that part. And when that part is shared with an abundance of God's love, with that giving, then you get to the place where, as Paul writes, you can start to comprehend what is the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of God that surpasses all understanding. And I become aware, you know, that I talk a lot about love. I'm, I'm not, uh, to say the least, I'm not a fire or brimstone preacher. But when I look at the scripture, that's what I keep finding. You know, if I probably if I didn't read scripture as much, maybe I wouldn't be compelled to talk about love as much. But also, I do know in my life, that's where the power has come from to get to the next day. That's where good things are grown. I think about how evident love is in our congregation. I mean, you can point to people like Hope, who is a living representation of uh, Chris and Lisa's love, or one who's bacon, <laughs> Mr. Jackson, not yet here, but that that love produces such a wonderful gift. And you, I think about, particularly as we approach Saturday's memorial, what hate produces. Again, I live and root in a God of love who embraces everyone no matter who they are, and draws them into becoming the people that God can see in the beauty of their soul. That's the God that I worship. But there are a lot of other people that name God differently. And there are even people, again, within the Christian faith, I'm not saying that this is only in faith, other faith traditions, but name God as one of hate and judgment and death. And we experience that rousing holy war against us uh, on 9-11 20 years ago. But that hate was destruction. And that hate 
caused pain beyond pain beyond pain. Not even those who were trapped in those buildings. Um, where I was living at the time, across the block were church members, and their son died in the Pentagon that day. There are too many people who died that day. But also I think it was the abruptness to me that people had been going along in their lives. I was driving to work. People had gotten on a plane. People had, they'd gone to work. And instead of being able to live out as we have in this country so often, the peace and security of our lives and hopefully being kind, although not always, I know people are not always, but that plan was brought to an abrupt halt. And pain was radiating out because of someone's decision that, I, 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 again, I can't even imagine that decision, but there was a decision made that somehow this would teach us or show us what we were. And what we were were people who rallied. First responders who went into building, burning buildings. People who got food and clothing and help together, just as they have this week down where Hurricane Ida has swept through. That's my people that I know. I know not everybody's, but my people that I know, the people of the church, our response is to embrace in love and try to help. We don't do that by accident. We do that because our love of God calls us into loving one another. Jesus' way of showing love, of talking about a God of love, of good news, who accepts us, who names us, who gives us a life of hope and freedom, is to say, so when you're hungry, I'll feed you. As I said, Grandma would feed you even if you were hungry, but if you're hungry, I'll feed you. I'll feed you. And I'll make visible the love of God that you can't even imagine how deep that is, how broad that is, how wonderful that is. But also, our faith, our understanding of who God is and what Christ lived went a step further. I'll show you what love looks like. Love looks like in the face of violence and hatred to stand and be beaten. Love looks like in the midst of false accusations and death sentences to die. And love looks like God breaking all of those barriers of death and pain to have Jesus come against, among us again and say, peace be with you. So this morning on this communion Sunday where we celebrate in the mix of pandemic, which is always harder because we can't be together. But even so, we remember that God's love was willing to sacrifice everything for us so that we could know how much God loves us. But as a parent, I understand that. Or maybe if you're not even a parent, but you have that dear child in your life, you'd do anything, anything, let them know how precious they are. You try anything so they could hear your words and feel the love that you have for them. I learned a lot about God's love for us when I attempted to parent children. But to me, that's the love of God that we are to be living out of. And so always to me, this is not just an interesting story or a how did he feed them or even what does it mean to understand the love of God that surpasses all boundaries? It means to also live it today, this week, at this time. To pray and love our world. To pray and love our enemies. Be nice if Jesus didn't say that, but he did. To love our enemies. To let the power of love transform our world more than anger or hatred or revenge at any time. And so we come not only this morning to celebrate God's love, to know that the holiday is here, 
but also to celebrate the events on Saturday or the remembrance of 9-11. And for me to say by faith that God's love is stronger, that God's power will continue to heal and make us whole. Because as people of faith, that's where I stand. And to pray for those who have been so deeply affected by so many difficult days. And know that God's love and healing are there and made real through the life, the ministry, the miracles, death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that we celebrate today. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.